Adam State College. Great stories begin here. Well, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Matt Nearing. I'm a professor of physics here at Adam State College. And I'm looking forward to giving this talk. I've been thinking about this for a couple of years as a, as a possible topic. And hopefully you will all enjoy it. So I'm delighted to have you as an audience. <clears throat> well, we don't need a... Okay, I guess everyone else gets that sort of thing as well, right? <clears throat> so uh, I was just talking with uh, Dr. Aldrich over here a little bit ago, and he offered to introduce me. But I think I can do a reasonable job myself. One thing that I have done in the past uh, to start classes when perhaps students are not quite as awake as they may, uh, maybe should be at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, you're eating pizza and I don't really want you to go to sleep. Um, and perhaps some other folks teaching in adjacent rooms have had, this, had a strange noise every once in a while. So I've often said that it would be great if we introduced physics much like we introduce a prize fight. And it would go something like this. Let's get ready for physics! <laughs> 8 o'clock in the morning, you might imagine, that does tend to wake up students. Okay, so hopefully you're here for the talk and not necessarily the pizza. Um, we do have a fine pendulum out here in, in the building, in the entranceway to the building, and I hope everyone at least had an opportunity to stop by perhaps before. If not, um, perhaps you'll stop by after. And uh, Leon Foucault in the middle of the 1850s decided or came upon the realization that you could really demonstrate that the earth does rotate. And we've, we've attempted to construct sort of a crude uh, demonstration for that out in the pendulum area. If you walked past there, you notice there's several little blocks on this wooden piece. These blocks are on hinges and we've been putting it up periodically for the last week or two. And as the pendulum moves, it goes over and knocks one of these little blocks over. And it doesn't seem too inspiring if you just walk by once or, once or twice a day and count the number of blocks. Um, perhaps that does mean to you that it moved. Perhaps it means someone came along and flicked a block. I don't know. If you take the time to spend, um, if you get lucky, you can time it so you only have to wait a couple minutes. If it's just about to hit a block, it'll actually go up there and just tap it once. And it goes back to the other side and it taps it a little bit harder. And it takes about two or three taps before it moves enough into that block such that enough of the pendulum does, or enough of the little block does get knocked over. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, hopefully, we'll have that periodically uh, on display. But on with the talk here. So the scientific contributions of uh, Leon Foucault. He, um, I guess I would like to start off in sort of a non-traditional way. One is to introduce a couple books. Most people would start off or finish their talk with their references. And I'll have a slide that has all my references as well. But I would like to encourage you to consider reading a couple of different books. One is Pendulum um, by Amir Azel. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. This one really reads like a novel. Okay? It's a story with the thread of being Foucault's life in science as well as outside of, uh, outside of science. But it also contains a lot of really interesting history from the late 1700s on through the mid to late 1800s, um, including the uh, Napoleon era or eras, depending upon how many you consider there. The other one is The Life and Science of Leon Foucault, and this one is much more in depth on his actual scientific contributions. This latter individual, William Tobin, seems to be about the world's expert. He's kind of devoted his life to uh, understanding Foucault's work, and it is interesting if you have the time to do it. The other thing I would like to do is acknowledge uh, Dr. Astalis for his help. Um, it was great having a physicist right next door. We would talk about different things for this talk, and I would tell him what I'm planning on doing, and he would, of course, come up with some improvement and say, it would be great if you did it this way instead. And I would say, yeah, but that's a lot of work. And <laughs> the next day, he would come back and say, well, I've solved the problem for you. Here you go. And so some of the demonstrations are really a result of his efforts as well. So where to begin with Leon Foucault? Uh, we could do the standard sort of thing and talk about his life, okay, 1819 to 1868. And if you do the math there, you see he was, by at least my standard, not very old when he passed away not quite 50. Um, he was college educated. He, got his, uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in physical sciences and then went on to medical school, comes from a fairly affluent background. Um, but <clears throat> perhaps a better way to sort of consider things is one of the most interesting quotes I came across while I was doing uh, readings and research for this talk was this one, his life presents nothing worth telling except the discoveries he made. Now most of us probably wouldn't consider that to be a very a uh, very high praise or a very high compliment to be paid. If you consider the source, it's maybe even worse than that. Uh, the tendency or the practice was for members of the French Academy of Science, 
when they passed away, a new member was elected and then they sort of commissioned a compendium of all the scientific works that they did during their life. And so the collected works of Leon Foucault, this is in fairly early pages there, saying, well, he really doesn't amount to much except the discoveries that he made. Most everyone is probably uh, looking forward to the pendulum piece. That's a pretty exciting uh, demonstration. There's some other contributions that he made, and I'm going to sort of split this talk into two different parts. We're going to talk some about the pendulum and also about the gyroscope. You see that I have different gyroscopes up here. I'll talk a little bit about one other fundamental physics experiment that he did, was, which was measuring the speed of light. And I'll also try and give you some flavor of some of the other pieces. And rather than start with the exciting stuff and finish on the other pieces that might put you to sleep, I'll first have you try and go to sleep and then perhaps wake you up with a physics yell, and then we'll get on to the more exciting stuff. So a partial list of discoveries and inventions. Um, he did a lot of work in daguerreotype photography. And he was a medical student, and he picked up the idea. I mean, photography was pretty new, creating images of uh, different landscapes and things like this. And he decided he sort of liked doing that. And he started doing it pretty much as a hobby. It was, if you look at his um, diaries and journals and so forth, it would sort of indicate that it was pretty much a weekend activity. But Foucault was an individual who really had a uh, very creative mind. He was very inquisitive. He was clearly an inventor. He was an excellent engineer. Um, he was, a, um, by some accounts, a good physicist. By other accounts, he wasn't a very good physicist. He certainly wasn't very adept at mathematics, which was probably his downfall. He wasn't elected to the Academy of Sciences until very late in his life, uh, in his late 40s. Um, and probably that had to do with his his lack of ability in the mathematical area. He just didn't understand it. But he did have an innate ability to understand the physical world. When he started this hobby of making photographs, he did what, I guess, lots of people who have an inquisitive mind and perhaps are a bit impatient do. They try to improve the process. And so immediately he started working trying to reduce exposure times. Exposure times for photographs in those early days were on the order of 20 to 30 minutes. Okay? So you can't take a photograph of many of the things that you want to see if it needs 20 or 30 minutes. So he tried to improve the chemical processes, tried to understand them. He <coughs> um, also tried to work and improve the images. So uh, improve the contrast, improve the clarity of the images, different things like that. He also put this to work um, as a student. So he was in medical school. He was in the classroom of uh, Alfred Donne, who is an individual who really brought the microscope into the realm of, medi of medicine and medical applications. Prior to Alfred Donne, no one really thought it was a good idea to study the microscopic world. We should be concentrating on other things. But he, as an instructor, felt it was important, and he brought that to his students. And so he would give lectures, and he's talking about the microscope, and sometimes he would have the individuals pass through in his class one at a time to look at different images, which isn't particularly efficient. So one day, Foucault came, comes up to him after class, and they're talking about the microscope, and Foucault more or less is telling his instructor that he doesn't have all the facts straight and that we can make improvements. And so they set about designing a system for uh, creating microscopic images that could be then passed around to different people. And I'm not going to talk, talk much about this, uh, this diagram here. It's a crude schematic of the different pieces. One piece that I would like to mention, though, is you notice that the light source for the microscope over here is sunlight. So we're back in the 1840s. There's electric, um, electricity has been invented, and it's pretty obvious that eventually we will get to the point that we will have fairly bright electric lights. But they didn't have very good control over them at that time. And so scientists used sunlight to study their images. So you would have this heliostat, which basically is taking the sun and making it stationary, if you will, You're not by stopping the sun, but bringing this apparatus to sort of track the sun and shine it on whatever, whatever system you needed to shine the light on. It's a lot easier to do that than to pay some graduate student to sit there and rotate the mirror every 10 seconds to maintain that appropriate alignment. So I'll come back to that heliostat in a moment as well as the sunlight, but it goes through this system here. You have a prism up on the top, and if you like uh, talking about physics, um, the light there is undergoing total internal reflection. Some of you in early physics classes probably have come across that. That was not a particularly new phenomenon at that time, but at least it was current. Um, some of the images that he was able to generate, or he and Albert Alfred Donne were able to generate, look like this. And they basically put together an atlas, as it was called, of about 80 slides. And these images, if you can read up close here, um, we have six images that are of blood and milk, corpuscles, crystals, and dot, dot, dot. 
but it's interesting. I guess I like looking at images like this. The year is 1844, probably some of the earliest microscope, uh, microscopic images that were available. Okay, so continuing on the partial list of discoveries, here's a <laughs> schematic diagram of, um, the, of a heliostat. He certainly improved the design of those, not while he was working on the microscope. This actually came a little bit later in his life, but I wanted to put it on this portion because <coughs> I also wanted to point out, this is a calendar, so those previous images, uh, those microscopic images, that was the summer of 1844. And they made 80 of these different uh, slides they had to prepare. And they got the exposure times down fairly small so that specimens wouldn't dry out and things like that. But this calendar runs from June at the very top of there all the way down to the end of September. And if we go ahead and look at the sunny days where sun was available to do these types of images, hey, we're looking at about 15 or 16 days. I think I even circled one that's wrong right there. It's cloudy. Okay, so there's not very much sunlight in Paris or sunny days in Paris, at least during the summertime in 1844. Sort of delays. You better have some other projects that you're working on at that time. Um, one other contribution that he made in the realm of uh, photography there was taking some daguerreotype photographs of the sun. That's really not the important part there. The, he and Fizeau worked out a mechanism by which you could have extremely short setter speeds and control them. So we're talking 1 60th to 1 100th of a second. Not a, very re, not a very long time frame to be opening and closing a shutter, particularly in that day and age, uh, the technology that they had available there. So really it's not so much the image that it was his contribution there as the mechanical system. We continue on with uh, different discoveries, the automatic electric arc light. As I said, it was obvious that they were going to be able to produce electric light or light through electricity, but some of the problems that they had, this was really done through an arc of electricity. And so you had these two probes coming out like this, and it was pretty unstable. Um, the, the distance between these, part of these pro, um, carbon rods would end up burning, and so the separation gets further apart. It's really uh, varies in the intensity. It goes up and down. And that really wasn't acceptable. So once again, Foucault just set his mind to it and said, well, I, I can design a solution to that. And he was able to come up with this system, which basically kept these two probes at the appropriate distance away and maintained a uniform brightness, or relatively so. He developed the, what I would probably uh, call the first tech classroom. Okay, we use that as, a, uh, as an acronym here on campus for uh, classrooms with technology. So a projector like this, he developed a projector. You could take the microscopic image and, hey, show it on an overhead like this, real time. This is, again, in the middle of 1840s, and uh, he's a medical student and presumably has some other things on his mind. But, hey, let's go ahead and do this in our spare time as well. Um, it's not still around, as with any technology. So I was just remarking at the overhead projector. We have one sitting over there. We have a couple down in the physics lab. And I was, happened to be walking by today, and I was thinking, when was the last time I used an overhead projector? This is certainly a technology that's going to go by the wayside, as is this technology eventually. The lifetime of this is probably three or five years. It probably was for that, his invention there as well. He did a lot of work in uh, uh, polarization, so birefringent crystals, and I'm just going to skip through these here again. This is really more a list of anything else. Um, he worked with a conical pendulum, so a, pen a conical pendulum is one that sort of swings around like this, okay, and the idea was trying to build a structure so that you could drive a telescope very reliably. They already had telescope drive systems at the time, but this was an attempted improvement on that. The speed of light in air versus water. This is really one of his fundamental physics experiments. I'll talk about this a little bit more here in a couple slides. Obviously, the Foucault pendulum. The diagram over here says that it's uh, 200 feet long, so he had various installations. That one was about 200 feet. The gyroscope, I have a couple of examples here. Foucault's gyroscope is there. Once again, he was, he was a very capable uh, physicist and was able to uh, create very precise machinery. And we'll talk about this gyroscope and the difficulties he had there a little bit as well. The discovery of eddy currents. I wish I had, um, I guess, 20 minutes here to do some demonstrations with eddy currents. They're always very exciting. If you've ever ridden a roller coaster where they have magnetic braking, okay, that's really the result of eddy currents. Mechanical equivalence of heat experiments. So those of you who've had chemistry or perhaps physics uh, know that James Joule did a lot of this work in the 1840s. Um, Foucault was about a decade late on that, and so no one really cared. They weren't quite the same experiments, but it was, to a certain extent, something that had been done. Induction coil experiments, developing circuit breakers, telescope lens polishing techniques, the knife edge test for um, determining the, perf the relative perfection of your mirror in your telescope. This is still in use today by amateur astronomers, not so much by commercial 
uh, commercial grade telescopes. They have better techniques than that these days, as you might imagine, but it still is in use. We still have more. Um, in the last decade of his life, he was associated with the Paris Observatory. And as such, he sort of combined his understanding of optics earlier with, I guess, the wishes of the administration and said, well, okay, I could build a fairly large telescope. 40 centimeters in diameter was the mirror. He developed an early form of adaptive optics. This one was quite remarkable to me. So one of the problems that he ran into was such a large mirror. So this 40 centimeter mirror has a fair amount of glass and it's sagging and things like this. He decided, well, one way to design a solution for that is to take a, an airtight rubber bag and insert it underneath the mirror and then he connected a hose to it more or less and this is a simplified description but connected a hose to it up to where the eyepiece was and the astronomer who's looking in the telescope the image is not quite correct the astronomer would blow in the tube trying to adjust the relative uh, pressure on the back side of that mirror which to a certain extent really is a, uh, an early form of adaptive optics after that, he decided to build a serious telescope, so to speak, and there's an image of it, just a sense of scale, 80 centimeters in diameter, but fairly large reflecting telescope. Um, and he also made some contributions. When he's working on these telescopes, it became more and more of a problem. The drive systems just weren't uh, sufficient or accurate enough, so he worked on that. And then he also went on to measure the speed of light again. This time it was quantitative. So, <coughs> middle slide. Leon Foucault, his life presents nothing worth telling except the discoveries he made. Um, I would maybe at least convince you in part that at least the exception there, the discoveries part, is uh, quite remarkable. That's quite a life, particularly for one who only lived to be 48. So you figure he had 25 years of being a scientist or so. Okay, so on to some of his fundamental physics questions. So he, in the early or the mid, mid to late 1840s, he had an associate or a mentor to a certain extent, Francois Arago, who had tried to measure the speed of light previously and effectively pushed Foucault in this direction and said, hey, we really need to solve this problem here. Is light a particle or is it a wave? By the early 1800s, most people were, or at least most scientists, understood that light really is a wave. It's not a particle. But those who were holding on to that particle theory, the corpuscular theory, if you like, or the emissionist view, um, they really didn't want to give up quite so easily. They said, no, we can explain this away. But most everyone agreed that if you could demonstrate the speed of light in, in water is faster than the speed of light in air, which seems very counterintuitive to me. I figured the first time I was reading that, it must be a typo, but that was really the phenomenon that was expected at that time. It has to do with refraction. So if you could demonstrate that one way or the other, then you would know it's a particle or it's a wave. And so he performed the experiment and here again, uh, as with a couple of the things that I've done so far, it's not particularly this experiment that I want to concentrate on. The idea is you have sunlight coming in from here. Okay, it goes through a beam splitter, fine. It's the, really this spinning mirror over here that's the important piece for my talk. Some of it goes this way through air, gets reflected back on itself, gets reflected again, and then you look at it and see how much it deviates. But it allows you to, to determine definitively, hey, did it go faster through air or did it go faster through water? But this spinning mirror, this is the piece that I want to concentrate on. As a, as a physicist of the day, and in particular Foucault, also having a strong tendency towards engineering, he built his own scientific apparatus. He had a good machinist, uh, I forget the first name, Froment I think was the last name of the individual, who basically helped Foucault build all of his scientific apparatus from the time he was 20 until the time he died when he was 48. He would build his own, uh, st his own steam engines. So the idea here is you have this mirror spinning over here. Well, you need something to spin it, and it's not going to be a person cranking it because the rotational speed he needed to achieve was about 800 revolutions per second. Now compare that to your automobile. You shift, you know, it's sort of revving up pretty high. Maybe you're running at 5,000 RPM a minute. So we multiply by 60. This mirror needed to spin at 48,000 RPMs. Pretty fast. So you needed to have something driving it. It's not going to be a person. And he spent a lot of time on this little tiny piece in here. Anytime you have something going quite that fast, you can develop some rather small instabilities that become fairly catastrophic. And so he spent weeks or months working on fine tuning, just adjusting these tiny little screws, trying to get some very delicate balance in this thing. What I'm trying to convey to you with this piece is that he did spend some time in machine shops and around different equipment, figuring out how to build things and so forth. And that comes into play later on. The result of the experiment, by the way, is that the speed of light in air is faster than it is in water. That pretty much put to rest these, uh, whether the particle theory or wave theory was correct. It's obviously the wave theory, 
for another 50 years or so until some genius named Einstein came along and said, eh, actually it's both. That's a topic for another day though. So he moved on from that unresolved question to another unresolved question which was does the earth rotate and you're probably sitting there going it can't possibly be an unresolved question in the 1800s and to a certain extent you're right. Uh, Dr. Estalis had given a talk about a month ago on the NASA Kepler mission and gave some of the history of our understanding of the solar system. So 1664 Isaac Newton developed his theory of universal gravitation okay, and key in that is that the, the planets actually uh, revolve around the sun. So that must have made people pause and think, but no, um, at this point at least the church wasn't putting people to death. Giordano Bruno in the 1600s said, hey, the universe is infinite and those stars, they're really suns like ours and they burned them at the stake in 1600. So they'd stopped that practice at 1664, which was good. 1665, um, Cassini discovered that Jupiter and Mars rotate. So if we have this solar system where everything is revolving around the sun and they're rotating on their axis, hey, Earth should be no different than some other planet. We probably are rotating as well, but not good enough. 1729, James Bradley discovers stellar aberration. Um, the equatorial bulge in the 1740s. Friedrich Bessel measures, measures stellar parallax. Okay, so there's no doubt the Earth rotates daily uh, and orbits the sun. The problem was this really wasn't good enough. So uh, Poisson, a very f famous mathematician, said in probably 1830s that really one of the most fundamental problems we have right now is we need to demonstrate the Earth actually rotates. We need clear, unequivocal evidence that it does do that. And then we can put this to rest and move on to some more interesting things. So Foucault decided that he would undertake that project. Now I was talking about Foucault working in a machine shop to a certain extent. And so there's lots of equipment. And one of the things that he noticed, and he's very clear about his inspiration for the pendulum, really came from a rod much like this, perhaps without the uh, pink rubber ball at the end. But it was a rod like this that was attached to a lathe. Okay? It was inserted in the chuck of a lathe. And what he found was if he would twang this, and the translation that is used is twang, so I don't know what that is in French, but okay, you twang this and it starts oscillating, right? Back and forth. So you put it in the, lathe, in a, the chuck of a lathe and you watch how it oscillates. And so this is a drill. I'll try and do my best to get the experiment working here. Not everyone will be able to see it, but... <coughs> so I'm going to twang this, it's going to start oscillating, and then I'll start rotating the drill. So get that plane of oscillation. And for those of you up in front, would you agree that it seemed to stay oscillating this way and not looping around? Yeah. Which is kind of a surprising result. I doubt many people would have picked that up. Uh, I, it was certainly surprising to me. It took some time to get it to work. I have a video of that for in case you weren't able to see it. So I did this in the lab just a couple days ago. We take this, uh, captured on video here, toying this thing. I muted it, that's why you don't hear the drill. But I did put a piece of tape on the, on the chuck of the drill there, so you see that thing going around, right? So I'm not just trying to convince you that, okay, yeah, see, it's, everything's wonderful. I could have been fooling you here with the sound. It really does maintain that plane of oscillation. This was his, the genesis of his idea that we can demonstrate the Earth's rotation. And it may seem a bit bizarre to make, or uh, difficult to make that leap from that type of motion to the pendulum, but if we were to take this drill and orient it like this and perform the same experiment, there should be no difference than the per experiment that I performed just like this, right? If I turn it vertically and I twang it, it goes back and forth, I can spin the drill and this thing is going to maintain its oscillation. And that's really no different than having something up here on the Earth, okay, and the Earth spinning down beneath it. If you were to take this drill to the North Pole, you find the exact spot on the North Pole and you were to do that. You twang it one direction, you start that drill moving in, uh, in circles like that, that's going to be exactly the same motion that you would get just by twanging this rod and letting the earth spin underneath it. It's just a question of support. If I were to take this rod and mount it in this device over here, which believe it or not is my model of the earth. It's a flat earth as you see, so we're sort of going back uh, predating um, many, many centuries I guess. The idea here is this is the earth and you're viewing it from the either above the North Pole if you like or if you prefer a uh, viewing things from the southern pole, that's fine too, we would just spin it the other way. So you're looking down on it like this and then you, the earth spins down underneath below you. So if I were to insert this into this system, which I'm not going to do, um, but if I were, I would claim that you twang it and you start spinning this and it maintains its oscillation. And the reason I'm not going to do it is it doesn't do that. <coughs> For a variety of very good reasons, not because the pendulum doesn't work. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm 
Oops, not that one, sorry. Okay, so the road to proof that the Earth is actually rotating here begins with a pendulum and the view from a non-rotating reference frame. So our reference frame here, most of you would probably agree we're not all spinning around in circles, at least as we view one another. And Yeah, I'm gonna do it in just a second, but thanks. So what I'm going to do here, and we'll take an, a camera image of this as well, is I'm going to let this thing spin, or let this thing oscillate back and forth, and if I stand over here, you see that this pendulum seems to maintain its plane of oscillation. It's running up against this uh, support over here and coming back to this side. Now what happens if I take this and then I spin it? And I think I will do the camera for this one. So we'll take an image of this at the same time. And I think I want a little more light. So we'll take a video of this, start it in the same way. So here's the orientation of that pendulum plane that was swinging, okay, and this thing is rotating around and that plane is maintaining itself, it's in this direction, okay. I'll show you a, a second video of that in just a second here, I'm going to stop that. So while I'm setting up the camera here. I've done something similar in the lab, okay, ba same basic idea here. I'm just going to start this video. You can probably see me walk in from the back. <laughs> start swinging it, then I spin the table. And I will claim that that plane of oscillation maintains the same orientation. If someone wants to disagree with me, I guess they're free to do that. So now we're going to look at the video we just took. If I can get this inserted. Okay, better get up on my stool. Unfortunately, I think I neglected to get it stopped, but we'll see. Green is play. Thank you, I'm expecting, no, it's not there, you're right. See, I told you Dr. Stallis helped me out here. Okay, so I'm hoping this is the video that we just took. <coughs> Technology. Seems to be consistent anyway. There's the oscillation and the spinning. So you can see, well actually there's not enough light here, so I'll show you another video here in a second. You can see every once in a while part of me coming around the outside here. But all we've done there is taken the same image that you just saw, it's oscillating like this, and I gave it a spin. Pretty remarkable, don't you think? So let me, actually I'll do this other one. I have one on here. So here's the difference. The view from a non-inertial reference frame, this is the technical term. The view from a non-inertial reference frame or an accelerating reference frame, okay? And it's accelerating because it's rotating. So let me just click on this and play this again. You can see the earth passing by underneath over here a little bit better if you look up in this corner and down over in that side. But look at the behavior here, okay? It's oscillating around in this rather weird trajectory. Now, it's a little bit enhanced here compared to what Foucault was able to deal with because he was sort of stuck with the earth. Not that he couldn't do this demonstration, but I could tell you, hey, this proves that the earth moves. Isn't that wonderful? And everyone would be, oh, I'm not really convinced, thank you. So you have to do it with a real pendulum. And, and Foucault was able to do that, but the problem is, okay, well, the earth rotates a lot more slowly than this table does. So the effect is not quite as dramatic. He also didn't have a nice camera like this where you could do some time-lapse photography and see that it actually works. There are lots of other problems associated with doing that. What's the... Um, Physics behind this is the same as the physics behind the low pressure systems, okay? The Coriolis force, if you will. Anyone heard of the Coriolis force before, probably? Okay. So let me, whenever possible, I like to introduce Lego into demonstrations. <laughs> so I have my two Lego brains here. And the reason I'm in inserting Lego into the problem <coughs> is that Lego does a much better job of moving this ball as it's rotating around, okay? So this device can sort of sit here on the outside of the rim, and I just need to establish contact between these two. And 
start this rotating. Thank you. It's good that I have someone watching out for me. Okay, we're connected here. And I'm going to videotape this again. Actually, I'm going to skip the, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip the video at the moment. I'll let you watch it once. I have a video right here. We'll just go ahead and play that one. But trust me, I'm not trying to pull anything over your eyes. We could do the video if we had a little bit more time. Okay, so here we have this thing. And <clears throat> I'm going to give this little ball a kick here while it's stationary to see, show you that it really does travel, okay, a little bit off center. Why is that? My table's not level. So I was trying to do this last night. It works a little bit better out here, but then this thing is in the way of the screen. So I put it on my cart. So it's not quite level, but let's see what happens anyway. And I, now I need to get my rotation in the right direction. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> now, which way do I want to spin this? I have to think about this for a moment. I think I'm going to go this way, right? You said I could ask you for help. No, I want it to go this way. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> confirmation over here. <laughs> we do want it to go this way. Okay, so I'm going to spin it this way and send it. And my claim is it's going to at least try to deviate this way, depending upon how sloped this is. So keep in mind which way is that way as it's rotating. Aha, it did, right? Okay. Now, if I move this to the center, so that was, a t that was an attempt to model motion of an object or a particle or whatever you like, part of weather, going from some point with latitude less than 90, so somewhere below uh, the North Pole, toward the North Pole. That's the deviation that the particle would experience as a result of this rotating reference frame. Now I'm going to take an object at the North Pole and give it a kick south, which is any direction that you like because every direction is south at the North Pole. So you give it a kick south, okay, and see what the deviation is. So I'm going to claim that it goes in the other direction, whatever that means, right? I'll spin at least in the same direction. Did we get it? It was the other direction? Yes? Do we have confirmation from someone else? Okay, good. I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you a video of this. It's difficult to keep your orientation as you're going around there, right? This thing is spinning and it's like you're looking down from above. But if you look at the video from above, it does become a little bit more clear. So we have the rotating piece here. We're doing it in the same order. So I have the ball out in this direction. And I should get the lights. This one was done on a more stable table. Goes. OK, so would you agree at least oh, two directions? One went one way and one went the other, other way. Same thing for a low pressure weather system, right? You get the counterclockwise or the, the counterclockwise rotation for a low pressure weather system. So stuff coming down from the north gets deviated that way. Stuff coming up from the south gets deviated that way. And generally, you have set up a counterclockwise rotation for it. Okay? The same is true of the pendulum. So as the pendulum swings back and forth in this accelerating reference frame, it gets a little kick to one side. And it's a much smaller kick than we see in that particular case, but it does receive a kick. Okay, so back on to regular slides here again. <coughs> um, so in the early morning hours of January 3rd, this is from Foucault's journal. Okay, he says, gosh, it almost, uh, almost worked. It's encouraging, but my wire broke. So his pendulum was a pendulum, I think it was on the order of five kilograms or something, that was the bob, and he had about two meters of wire. So it really is in his basement. And when he actually did achieve success, it was less than a week later, 2 a.m., again, early morning. And he may have just been a night owl, but there are some serious problems that he uncovered. For example, the fact, if he was trying to do this experiment during the day, you have carriages and you have a lot of traffic outside, okay? Not traffic like we have, but horse carriages. You have trains. What he found is all these things influenced the pendulum, which made it a really sensitive experiment. And so he stays up at 2 o'clock in the morning when the rest of Paris has gone to sleep and he's performing these experiments. And within a week, he went to talk to his mentor, uh, Francois Arago, and said, hey, look at this result. I've proved that the Earth actually does rotate. And immediately, they sent out invitations to the rest of the French Academy of Sciences, arranged for an installation at the Paris Observatory with an 11-meter pendulum. 
So the 11 meter pendulum is very similar actually in height to the one that we have out here. We're looking at about a, a six and a half second period or something like that. If you go out and measure it, it's somewhat similar to that. And so the invitation read, you're, well, you're invited to come see the Earth turn tomorrow from 3 to 5 at Meridian Hall of Paris, the, of the Paris Observatory. Well, there are complications, okay? First of all, the pendulum motion is slowly damped out. Um, for anyone who thinks that we have a perpetual motion machine out here, and I have heard people say that, gosh, this pendulum rotates forever. It does rotate forever as long as you have something giving it the right kick, okay? If this really did work under its own gravity, it would be great. We could go to the President of the United States and say, hey, we've solved the world's energy problems. Rather than having wind farms, we would just isolate a bunch of uh, Foucault pendulums and say, hey, life's great. Okay, you could get it to do whatever work you wanted. It doesn't work that way. Um, broken wires is a big problem. After he had the installation at the Paris Observatory, he had another installation at the Pantheon, and this one was a 67-meter pendulum. And it was on public display, so people would come by and see it and so forth. And after about two months of operation or so, the wire broke. 67 meters of wire <laughs> come whipping down like that. Um, my understanding is no one was at least killed. I didn't hear any or read any reports of the accidents, which I would have thought in my research I would have. But there's also a looping behavior problem. Um, due to lopsided shapes, it turns out you really have to be careful when you cast these pendulum bobs. If there's any, uh, any difference from one side to the other, you're going to get into some problems. Flexing of the wire even becomes a problem, and I just discovered this the other day, um, yesterday as a matter of fact. I'm foolish enough to say, well, gosh, this pendulum that I had hanging here with this rope was stretching, okay? And I had it sitting here, and I came in yesterday morning and ran it, and it's already touching this. And I'm like, okay, I've got to change this. I don't want it to stretch. I'll put in a wire support, and I did it, and immediately ran into problems because the pendulum starts going around like this, okay? The wire was um, not quite as agreeable to the torsion as that rope would, okay, and so it starts kicking it out, and I'll show you a quick video clip of that here on this next slide. And this one's not really dramatic. So I started the pendulum, and you notice it's swinging right across that middle piece there. And within about five swings, if you look carefully, you'll see that the pendulum is going underneath that spot and above that spot. And we're talking, you know, six or seven swings, and all I did was Swap out one pendulum for one with a wire support. Okay? So there really are some rather annoying problems that you have to deal with. Foucault suggested after success, of course, what he said is, passing from theory to practice, the physicist must expect disappointments. And in the present case, he must think himself very happy if with a real pendulum he is able to obtain an unequivocal deviation in the expected direction. Okay? Because there are so many problems with this. I've listed this, oops, um, this equation here, partly because it is a lunchtime talk in science and math, so we better have a little <laughs> bit of math in here. <coughs> but it is also a complication, okay? It turns out that the period of the pendulum, and by this I mean, don't mean the period back and forth, but rather the rotation around like this. So it swings like this, okay? How long does it take to complete one complete cycle like that? And it goes as the inverse sine of the latitude. Take 24 hours, the latitude at the North Pole is 90 degrees, ni sine of 90 degrees for those of you that had trigonometry is one. Hey, great, it just sort of spins around like that table does with a period of 24 hours. At latitudes south of that, it's somewhat um, different. The latitude of Alamos is about 37.5, so we should have a period of almost 40 minutes okay, as we go around. Foucault presented this with his work to the uh, Academy of the French Academy of Sciences, but he didn't derive it, nor did he ever end up deriving it or presenting his derivation. What he said was, well, here's the result, and it's a lot of geometry, and I don't want to bother you scientists and mathematicians with a der derivation like that. Um, here's the result, and it caused quite a stir for months afterward, people clamoring to try and explain the physics and the mathematics behind it and had a lot of difficulty. Um, I think Foucault was probably a little bit lucky uh, coming to this conclusion here. But it might be like some other things, okay? Uh, it could be f uh, Foucault's conjecture. He says, well, this is true and it's obviously true. I'm not going to bother with things. Let someone else do it. So, <coughs> the pendulum, marking the passage of time since Galileo or so. The period of the pendulum swinging back and forth goes as the square root of L over G. And another topic for a talk is that, hey, at one point the meter was actually defined using a pendulum. Um, but I've included this animation over on the left-hand side. This is tracing out basically the shape that you saw over here in the video, okay? 
And if you watch the video clip over here, maybe I'll run it one more time if I can, it is tracing out that same shape. Okay? And the number of loops that you get in there depends upon how fast you're spinning this table. But if, if you were standing outside this table like you all are, it's just swinging back and forth in its plane. It's that rotating reference frame that's causing the problems. So, on to other exciting work. Foucault, somewhat unsatisfied. I mean, the pendulum is a really grand experiment, right? And it's really captivating for public audiences and is really quite impressive. But he really wanted and had some ideas of how you could demonstrate the Earth actually rotates in real time. And he did that with a gyroscope. And the idea behind a gyroscope is that it maintains its direction. Foucault did not invent the gyroscope. You can find references that say he did. Um, he did coin the term gyroscope. And if that means inventing, then I guess we should all think up lots of terms and words um, and become filed patents on them or something, which people have done from time to time. So I have a gyroscope up here. <clears throat> and I am leaving it on this table because I want to spin it around. So I have an electronic spinner rather than a hand crank spinner. <coughs> Foucault's pendulum is right here. This device is one with several gears to where you could crank like this, okay, and with the right gear ratio, you really get it spinning very, very fast. Again, he was a precision uh, engineer and machinist to a certain extent. He was able to get a, uh, a, pen or a gyroscope that actually would continue spinning for eight to 10 minutes. Okay? And ours are no, nowhere near that. I'm going to spin this up a little bit here. It's trying to gain traction. It's going to rattle a little bit, I warn you. OK. Now, as I spin this around, you see the gyroscope maintains its orientation, right? Still pointing pretty much the same way it was. So Foucault thought, hey, what a great opportunity. We can take this gyroscope that maintains its orientation and determine that the Earth actually rotates. One other interesting piece, <coughs> what I will, and actually I guess I'll hold off on, no, I'll do it now. I have a second gyroscope here, and I'm going to spin this up, watching the clock time very carefully so I don't run out. If you've ever held a gyroscope that's spinning in your hands, it's pretty impressive, okay? It's, they're difficult to turn because they want to maintain their orientation. This squeaky gyroscope here. Okay, so I'm going to hold it with this wire and I'm going to let it go and it just spins around like this. Now, this one is squeaking and has lots of friction inside it, which is part of the problem, okay? But we get it spinning, and it wants to maintain that direction. So let's imagine that I were to um, main uh, I start it so that its axis of rotation is like this. Okay? By me holding on to it up here and letting go of the other side, gravity's pulling down. I think everyone will agree with me there. I'm pulling up this way, which tends to cause it to rotate like this. Right? If I just let go like that, we all agree it tends to rotate that way. So there's a tendency to cause a rotation this way. So I have my axis of rotation this way, and I'm exerting what's called a torque on it, okay, in this way. And what the torque does is basically change that direction of orientation. It wants to stay spinning this way, but I'm giving it a kick in some sense in this direction. So it wants to maintain this way, and I say, no, change it a little bit. So it changes like this. Now I'm exerting a torque this way, okay, or causing a rotation as we spin around. My torque and the direction of axis of rotation are always in perpendicular directions, there's a third axis of rotation there that causes that to sort of precess around as it goes like this. So <coughs> Foucault wanted to look at this and say, well, let's use this to measure the Earth's rotation. And so he did. He could take this entire apparatus, or this toroid or torus here, insert it into that crank, get it going really fast, insert it back here. It would spin for 8 to 10 minutes. And in that 8 to 10 minutes, hey, the Earth has rotated through some small angle. And with a microscope off to the right, he could look at it and say, yep, it sure did. It moved a little bit. Now, you can imagine that this is not quite as captivating as a demonstration for the general public as the pendulum is. But it nevertheless provides very direct evidence of the rotation of the Earth. Wrong key. OK, so the difficulty clearly is friction. You don't want it to slow down. This comes back into his ideas of 
or his abilities in the area of engineering and precision machining. In 1852, he presented the results of the experiment. Remember, he did his pendulum experiment in January of 1851. This is September of 1852. All indications are he had it done much, much earlier than this, but was sort of waiting for summer breaks to get over. And he wants everyone back to sort of uh, bask in the glory. So he had eight to 10 minute drifts of the gyroscope. He also did some cool demonstrations, which was a gyro compass. And a gyro compass is basically a gyroscope that points north, let's say. And you might ask, say, well, this is really a gyro compass already, right? I just spin it, speed it up, point it north, and let it go, and hey, it just keeps spinning, and it points north. But a compass, no matter what you do to the compass, you take it out of your pocket, it finds north for you. So a gyroscope that is really a gyro compass is something that finds north. And I'm going to do a, two quick final demonstrations here for you. I have to do this in a two-dimensional world, okay, because, well, I'm not the precision machinist that, uh, that Foucault was. And I probably didn't have the weeks and months that he spent either. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock this thing in, in place so that it really has only the one option for moving. So it's going to still spin around its axis. So if, you, if I try and turn this table, I can no longer do that. Okay? It can still spin this way, and it'll still spin on its axis. So I will spin this thing up, okay? and then I'm going to give this table a little bit of a rotation. And what you'll see is this will align itself with the rotation axis of the table. So it's going to align itself with this rotation axis. I'll start it off in this configuration, and it won't take it long, and it's going to jump to this configuration. Doesn't matter which way I spin it, it will always do that. Come on. Okay, spinning like this. You sort of saw one leg lift off, right? And it's orienting itself with that north. If I spin it faster, it's likely to flip over. If, however, I do turn it in the other direction, it does the same thing, right? It flips to get its direction of rotation the same way that the Earth is moving. Foucault was able to do one better than this. He could lock both uh, different axes individually. And so for the Academy of Sciences, he said, well, let's imagine this. And he goes through a lot of discussion of torque, which I don't have time to do, but sort of gave you some flavor of it here. When you lock an axis like that, a torque is generated, and so it wants to orient itself some, some other way. It'll react in the only way that it is left. So he would lock one axis and say, well, OK, here we go. And they would wait some period of time, and it would align itself in the horizontal direction with the meridian or the north-south line. Then he would release it from that direction, lock the other axis, and it would start drifting up in this direction until it actually pointed in, uh, with the axis along the axis of the North Pole, which is quite astounding, particularly for someone looking back at the technologies available in the 1850s. So those were some uh, good experiments that he did there. How to finish this talk? Well, probably the way we started in 1819 to 1868. Um, his life presents nothing worth telling except the discoveries that he made. And I thank you for your attention today. There's the list of references. I can answer a question, but it has to be quick. We've got to get out of here. All right. Adams State College. Great stories begin here.